This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Huskers Radio Network Analyst, Jeremiah Searles. And we're back for another episode of the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, alongside Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cooty, and got a few things to get into, but today is the day we're going to talk all things offensive line. We've been chatting about this podcast, like getting into the weeds of all things offensive line. I know Jeremiah is beyond excited to talk some O-line here today, but before we get into that, I did want to talk a little bit of Husker news because literally the last podcast that we taped, you were talking about the crowded quarterback room and that it was no doubt there's going to be a transfer or two. And then that day was when I think Logan Smothers came out or Richard Torres, then Logan Smothers, and then Casey Thompson. First of all, your reaction on on the quarterback transfer additions. The Torres one was kind of a no-brainer for me. I thought that one was for sure going to happen. The Casey Thompson one surprised me a touch. Um, You know, I thought that what we saw from Sims and what I've seen from Casey playing at Texas and what he did for us last year, I thought he was going to have a really good chance to come in and compete in that room for the starting job. And I would have liked to see that. Um, but that being said, you know, he has one year left. He kind of probably wants to go somewhere where he can be the guy. Don't blame him for that at all. So, you know, not wishing all those guys nothing but the best, you know, no ill will towards any of those guys. And now it looks like it's going to be Jeff Sims show to, to go through here. I mean, Harburg will have a chance to compete. Purdy will compete too, you know, but I think Jeff Sims has the leg up after coming out of spring. Okay, and Coach Rule has talked about this, and being that they just came from the NFL, when they went into when they when they went to the NFL, the portal was not as big of a of a thing, and then now it's just really taken over college, really all of college athletics. Uh, it, it's just such a huge part of it now. But the way that he's talked about it, and he's talked to his staff about it, who also came from the NFL, about having these conversations. I think they had a conversation with Casey about what things could potentially look like, how he might fit in the offense, all that. I think the, the conversations are ongoing. So being that they just came from the NFL and where it is, it's kind of like this already. How much do you think that's a benefit for some of these players that, you know, just being honest and, hey, this is what it's going to be? Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, college football mirrors NFL free agency now. Right. I mean, you have guys that quote unquote contracts are up or they're looking for extensions. And, you know, there's conversations of where do I fit? How do I fit? And, you know, and obviously there's money involved in it now, too. So, you know, there's all those things that go into it. And so Rule and his staff have a really good grasp on how to talk to players that may be wanting to leave, but you want to stay or trying to find a, a price point or trying to find a mesh point of how things work and how they're going to fit in the offense. I mean, those are all conversations that happen throughout the entire year. Um, You know, so really just it's really good um, that Rule can have all that background. It's also good that he's preparing these players for what it's going to be like when you walk into the NFL in a way, too. So and we, we've talked about this, too, about O-line, which I do think there were more offensive linemen in the portal this year than we saw last year. And it's just really tough to get. Uh, a solid offensive lineman. Nebraska did get one in Ben Scott, but it's just not typically a position you see an influx of, of players into. But now now in age, and it was a lot different too when you signed on to play college football, and everybody wants to play right away, but do offensive linemen understand that, hey, you're, you're basically going in and you probably are not going to play as a true freshman? I mean, that's the hope. I mean, I think that recruiting has changed a little bit, that you have to tell guys they're going to have an opportunity to play as a true freshman um, because you've got to set realistic expectations. You know, and when you're coming to a team, if you're a top-notch recruit, five-star, four-star recruit, like, you feel like you could impact right away. You know, and I think that it's fair to tell guys, you know, the best player will play. You know, that's what Pelini told me. That's what I was told in the NFL. Like, regardless of your age, regardless of your draft pick, regardless of where you're at, you, if you're the best player, if you're one of the best five, we're going to put you out there. And, you know, I think that until you get here as a freshman and you walk out on that field in spring ball or you walk out for training camp for the first time and you can really go physically, I'm not quite ready to contribute. You know, physically is the biggest jump from high school to college. The speed of the game, the physicality of the game going against 22 year old men when you're an 18 year old is a drastic difference in how you're built just physically, you know, and that's the biggest jump. And then you don't even include some of the mental gymnastics you got to go through of reading defenses, finding fronts, understanding combination schemes, protection schemes, you know, all those things play into it. You know, so as a young offensive lineman, if you get on the field as a true freshman, you're you're an animal. You're an absolute stud. And there's a couple of those guys. I mean, there's a couple of guys around the country that played as true freshmen that are going to be probably three and out type guys. 
you know, but those are special guys. I mean, guys, you don't really see take the big jump in their games till year two, year three, when they've had big developments in the weight room, big developments through spring ball, a couple fall camps under their belt, and then they can go out there on the field and not just survive, but contribute. You know, I think at times when young guys get out there and they get thrown in the fire, they're just trying to survive the game instead of actually contributing to help your team win. Okay, so let's get into all things offensive line talk, kind of on that note a little bit. So when you are making the either maybe you're making a position switch or when you're in high school and you're starting to play offensive line, what what's the first things that you learn as an offensive lineman? Absolutely, you know, so coming from high school, you know, if you're if you're a highly recruited offensive lineman, it's because you're ginormous. <laughs> and that means that you played against very small people in high school and you could get away with bad technique because you're like, oh, I'm just much larger and stronger than you, so I'm just going to throw you on the ground. You know, when you show up to your first training camp, you start understanding I can't get away with that anymore because everyone here is ginormous and everyone here is strong. And I'm probably not the strongest guy anymore. In fact, I'm the bottom of the totem pole. And so the first thing you have to learn is that you can't play offensive line without tremendous technique. It is a technique driven position, just like the quarterbacks, just like a lot of positions. But offensive line is a fully technique driven. That's why you see the greats that play for 10, 15 years are just known as clinical technicians. Because you can get away without being the biggest, fastest, strongest guy if you're a technician. So the first thing you need to learn is your footwork, your hand placement, the difference of angles of departure on your pass sets, angle of departure on your run blocks, how to fit into certain run blocks, hand placement, hat placement. like All those things are just day one stuff that you have to start putting together because if you're just like, oh, I'm just going to run off the ball and hit this guy – it's not going to work because that guy's going to shuck you or pull you if you're not in balance. So the number one thing is just learning about the techniques that your coach wants you to do and how he wants you to execute certain blocks. Okay, so on that note, because we got into this, and this is what sparked this idea to have this kind of conversation is, you know, the, the technique and, and Matt Rule keeping on Donovan Rayola and, and having another year for these guys to be with uh, Coach Rayola and learn his technique. So I think maybe maybe some people know, maybe some people don't, but but not every offensive line coach has the same technique, right? Oh, gosh, no. Yeah, no, gosh, no. And, you know, that's why you see guys that are like, well, why isn't this guy developing? It's like, well, how many O-line coaches did he have? How many times did he have to relearn how this guy wanted him to set? How many times did he have to relearn, is he a two-hand puncher? Is he a double-hand puncher? Is he an outside puncher, inside? You know, all those things where if you don't just rep it, every single day, week after week, year after year, it's impossible to become a master of your craft. And so I think that was a big piece of keeping Rayol on is like, okay, we saw what the old line could do last year, struggled at times, but we can see the improvement. We can see what they're doing well. Let's give them another year in this to see if they can take that next jump. You know, I think of a guy like Turner Corcoran, you know, who's played left tackle, he's played guard, he's played right tackle. Like, that's hard to do with development too when you're bouncing around because I, I tell the story all the time, people are like, hey, it's not that hard to switch from left to right, right? Like, it's really easy. And I always tell people, like, yeah, next time you go to the bathroom, try wiping with your off hand and tell me how easy it is. <laughs> like, it's not. It's not an easy thing to do. And so, you know, that all plays into it. So I think that Coach Rule understands, like, we're going to have to rebuild this team in certain ways, but we have a veteran group at offensive line. Let's keep a coach with them, and let's keep them perfecting their craft and keep them – we'll, we'll kind of move some things around to fit the new Satterfield offensive scheme. But overall, the technique, we want them to keep the same technique and grow off of what they did the year before. So how does one go about uh, – if you're coaching offensive line, go about – developing that technique is it something that you played with that you've taken away i mean how do you differentiate and separate what's great technique technique and what's not yeah you know so let's just start with the basic of what i think this team's bread and butter is going to be i think they're going to be a zone offensive team you know watching practice watching the spring game you saw a lot of inside zone outside zone and you know so all of that starts with the fundamentals of the guys up front and you know i'll tell you when you can watch a good zone football team all five guys look like they're mirror images of each other. Everyone's taking the same first step because everyone's on the same angle of departure. Everyone's getting their second foot in the ground. Everyone's got their hat placement, right? So let's just start, if you're the tackle, right? If you're the tackle to the play side of, an, of a zone scheme, 
you got to take a good outside first step to gain ground to gain leverage, right? You can't step laterally. You can't step forward. You have to lose ground, excuse me, lose ground a little bit, gain some leverage, second hand, second foot in the ground. You know, you'll hear offensive line coaches say this over and over again, get your second foot in the ground. And the reason is, is because that's where you generate all your power. You do not move someone if you get caught with your second foot in the ground. So you'll hear guys go one, two, one, two. And you want to see lose ground and then second foot in the ground on your aiming point. If it's an inside zone, your hat, your helmet is the aiming point as a tackle is the inside via the neck because you want to pry him out there. If it's outside zone, it's his outside peck, right? So you have different aiming points. And that's what I talk about for angles of departure of where you're leaving and where you're firing out of your stance. And the second thing is your hand placement. Right? If you're going to be in an inside zone, you want your inside hand into that guy's out inside armpit so that you can pry him out. If it's outside zone, you want your inside hand to his breastplate so that you can reach him and widen the hole. Right, So all those things are just one scheme of just your first two steps in the ground. And then all of that comes into, okay, now we're going to do this over and over and over again so that now if he spikes across your face, you can adjust. If he loops outside, you can adjust. If he sprints up the field, you can adjust. But it all starts with your first two steps in the run game. Everything has to do with getting your two feet in the ground, generating your power, and then rolling your hips and running off the ball, which is what you hear Coach Rule say, you hear Coach Rayola say, you know, we don't want, so many times I think the older days of football is like waddle off the ball, right? You saw the duck walk, you always get made fun of for it. But these guys are so fast on the other side of the ball, now you got to run, right? You got to run, but you got to run with the base and you got to run with power. And so that's a big thing that I saw Rayola drilling those guys is, hey, run off the ball, run off the ball, two feet in the ground, but you got to run with the base, you know? So all those things come into play as the outside tackle, you know, but when you're talking about when you're inside and you're with the guard, now you're talking about fits. Now you're talking about, hey, how do these guys fit together? How are they going to work together? Are they shoulder to shoulder? Make sure they're not stepping all over each other. Everyone has to take the proper footwork so that if I'm stepping left, the center's not stepping right and we get split. You know, all those things come together, just working with each other and understanding the fits. But, you know, the zone scheme here is going to be so critical for how these guys go. And that just is so much of your aiming points, your footwork, and then running off the ball. So on that note, did have a question that someone sent in. Um, you know, some would say that defensive players like DNs and linebackers are evolving to be smaller but faster to help with pass rush coverage. Has the prototypical offensive lineman evolved from what it used to be 10 to 20 years ago? Absolutely. You know, I think the days of the 340 pound monster at tackle is just not really a thing anymore. When you've got guys like Nolan Smith from Georgia running a 439 off the edge, you got to be able to pass protect, you know. But where I think that offensive line can still have the advantage is we are still 300 plus pounds. You know, you, the perfect offensive tackle for me is between 305 and 315. You know, I think that's the good weight because you have to be athletic enough to run. You have to be able to be mobile enough, but you have to be able to also sit down on a bull rush from one of those guys that's running that type of speed and running straight into your chest. You know, so you saw it. Guys like Ben Hart and Corcoran and Teddy have kind of slimmed down a little bit from last year. You know, they're not as 320 anymore. I think three more like 315 to 310, you know, those areas because it's exactly like you said, it's evolving. The, the offensive line is evolving, being able to run and get out in space and do certain things and also be able to get back off the ball and your pass set and create length and create width with how you're blocking these guys. So, you know, the offensive line is forever and always evolving. And I think we're a little bit behind the eight ball, honestly, because the guys on the other side are getting freakier. They just are. I mean, from the NFL down into college, you're seeing these defensive ends that are six foot four, six foot five, 265, 270 pounds <laughs> running a four six or a four five. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's not fair. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we have to be able to adjust. And that's where it comes back to how I started this of you can beat those guys with technique. You don't have to run a four six going backwards in a pass set in order to cut the angle off and throw your hands and disrupt that guy. And that's where coming into having good technique and understanding your angles of your sets um, really gets into it. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years. Another question that was submitted, an agent side question. What do mm. scouts and our agents look for when grading O-line and O-line prospect for the NFL? Oh, I love that because all I do is watch tape. I mean, I watch tape for hours on end. You know, one of the first things that I look for in an offensive lineman, and it's funny, uh, it's not actually a technique thing. It's do they show up in the end zone cut? And what I mean by that is when you're watching tape, there's two different films. There's the sideline and then there's the end zone. 
And what I mean by show up in the end zone cut is what are you doing when the ball's not to you, right? So if it's a run play and the running back squirts out for a 10-yard gain, are you down there pushing the pile? Are you down there helping your running back up? Are you protecting your guys? He's running, his guys are stripping at the ball. Or if it's a run away from you, are you just kind of jogging on the back end and loafing and not hustling to the football? You know, that's one thing that scouts and um, agents that watch tape look for because you can't coach effort. You can coach technique. You can help with pick, cleaning up certain things with their footwork and their hands. But I can't light a fire under a guy and be like, how come you're not running after the ball? How come you're not chasing down the ball? How come you're not covering down the field? You know, those are the first things I look at. Then the second thing I look at is their finish when they're attached to someone. You know, if they get two steps in the ground and they're running after a guy, are they finishing him trying to get him in the dirt? Or are they like, oh, I did my job. It's over. Okay, next play. You know, and then also watching that throughout an entire game. Hey, does he start fast? Is he a fast starter in the first quarter and he's looking good? And then by the fourth quarter, he's dragging, you know, or is he a finisher from play one to play zero or play one to play 100? You know, those are those are something I look at as their finishing ability and pass protection. Um, I honestly look at if they're set, you know, OK, hey, now moving from now from the kind of uncoachable things of the finish and the effort of what you, what's your makeup. Now I look more on the technical side. You know, okay, where is his pass set at? Is he a vertical setter? Is he a horizontal setter? Is he going to get back off the ball? And does he have different tools in his tool belt? You know, does he have multiple different sets? Does he throw his hands? And then honestly, you just also want to look when a guy gets beat. Okay, he just gave up a sack. Okay, he gave up a sack. Let's watch the next couple pass plays to see if he adjusted. Let's see if he made adjustments or did he go in the toilet, right? Did, oh, okay, because in the NFL, you're going to get beat. It's not a matter of do, it's a matter of when. Like you're going to get beat. How do you adjust to that? Can you mentally come back from that and bounce back from that? And body language, right? Are you hanging your head? Are you clapping your hands? Does it matter to you? Like, are you upset? Are you visibly upset? Or is it kind of like, ah, it doesn't matter to me? You know, all those things go into it. And then from a run game perspective, you try and say, okay, hey, can he get to the second level? Can he get to the second level and can he stay attached, right? Is he bouncing off of linebackers? Are linebackers pulling him? Because that probably means he doesn't have great core strength when he gets attached to these linebackers. Where are his hands? Are his hands circling outside? Are his hands firing inside? You know, I'm trying to evaluate all that through uh, just tape and tape and tape. And then once you kind of get a grasp on a player of like, okay, he has the physical tools to play in the NFL, that's when you then have to reach out to the player and get him on a Zoom call much like this and try and see the mental makeup. Mm -hmm. Hey, are you a student of the game? Do you understand concepts? Do you understand formations? Or do you just live in your little box? And just trying to get a better picture of what the mental makeup of that player is too. Because if you can't understand a complex offense, the number one thing that's never going to put you on the field is if the coach doesn't trust you. Because that quarterback standing behind you is a 20 to $25 million a year <laughs> investment. And they're not going to put you on the field if you don't know what to do. So it's a combination of... Does he have the physical tools? Does he have the finish? And then does he also have the mental makeup to be able to understand and pick up what an NFL offense will be? And then does he have the understanding, the ability to take that and put it on the field and then put the two together? Can he put the physical ability? Can he put the mental ability and then contribute in the NFL? You know, so that's a quick synopsis, a quick snapshot of what I do when I look at players. That's what scouts are doing when they look at players. Um, because in the pre-draft process, a team really only has about an hour and a half total of face time with these players. And that's if they meet with them at every step of the way, the all-star game, the combine, the pro day, and then maybe a, a 30 visit and maybe a, a private workout. But you're trying to very quickly understand what about this kid to see, can he make it on my football team? You know, so that's just kind of what I go through in my process. I've talked to a lot of scouts. That's what the gate they go through in their process. And then obviously that's just a very base level. And then as you get deeper into it, you start digging more into the kid's past, into mom and dad situation, into where did he come from? Is he a three sport athlete? Is he a two sport athlete? Did he, what he major in? Is he nice to all the people in the, in the building? Is he a turd in the weight room? Like all of that is such a, a giant puzzle piece that the NFL tries to put together on each player um, that we try to do as an agency as well. Fascinating. Um, I know we are uh, got a little time crunch today, but we might have to save this and do a part two because there's so much that you can get into. Um, but I did want to get your thoughts on this because Coach Roll was just on Sports Nightly for his hour-long spring show, and he, mm. he really bragged on the offensive line. He said, there is not a position group on this football team that's more bought in than the offensive line. And we've heard it 
a lot how they are really close knit. They hold each other accountable. I mean, they are hard on each other and um, just the way that this group is, it, they seem to just really be leading, which is what you've been kind of talking about for a while now of getting to that point. And so I guess what, what's, what was your take on that when you went out to spring practice and how happy does that make you to hear how much Coach Rule is really just loves this group and thinks they're doing all the right things at this point? Yeah, you know, the offensive line has to be the leader of the offense, and arguably I feel like it needs to be the leader of the team. We are the one group that has five people on the field at all times. You know, receivers can have four, D linemen can have four, you and know, they're not playing together someone, a lot. And they're they're not playing together. Like you are the heartbeat of your team. The offensive line is. There's no doubt about it. You are the heartbeat. You are the engine. You are the guy in the bottom shoveling coal into the big steam engine to make it go. And without five guys working as one the team will not go. And so to hear that you have the whole line bought in, that means that all the team is looking at those five guys. And you know, it's probably more like eight or nine guys right now, you know, but you have to have your front five that are willing to just step up to the front and go follow me or get out of the way, right? Like the train's coming and we're going to push it and we're going to go. And if you're not going to be there, then just get out of the way because we don't want you. We don't need you here. You're either going to get behind us and follow us and push us and keep us going, but we're going to be the pace setters. We're going to be the setters. I mean, my senior year, we had four senior offensive linemen. Three of us played in the NFL for six plus years. We ran that team. You know, that's what you have to have because A, you're the biggest guys in the room, so you command a lot, but B, you have to earn it every day. And if you're having success, you have to know that you're not going to get praised for it. You have to know that it's not because of what you're doing because everyone else is going to get the glory and the glitz. But you also have to understand when things go wrong, it's always your fault. It's just the way it is. Like, oh, we didn't score enough points. Ah, offensive line didn't do their job. Right, like, and to an extent, that is true because of all the things I just said. So you got to have thick skin as an offensive line, but I love that Coach Rule's empowering his offensive line. They've obviously earned it. I don't. I know Coach Rule's not a guy that's just going to throw praises out there just to throw praises out there. You know, so from winter conditioning into spring ball, I think they've earned that right. And now it's their job to go continue that through the summer program into training camp, and then honestly, we'll see the real fruition of it in September. You just delivered like an O line sermon right there. Oh, yeah. Don't let me get on my soapbox. You let me get on my soapbox about O-line play. We will be here for a long time. Hey, got a couple rapid fire questions. So mm -hmm. who was the best offensive lineman you played beside or on Ooh. the same line as? In in the NFL? I think either. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I got to I got to learn from Nick Hardwick, who was a 12 year center, all pro, Pro Bowl center for the San Diego Chargers. Um, he was there out of Purdue. I still talk to him to this day. And he really taught me how to be a pro and what it meant to be a pro. Um, you know, some of the freakiest guys I've ever played next to, um, a guy named King Dunlap from uh, San Diego as well. He was 6'10, 335 pounds, and ran like a deer. You know, just an absolute freak show um, in that respect. And then, you know, some of the really good guards um, that I played next to, Brandon Fusco in Minnesota uh, was a great guard that I played against. And that was with Matt Khalil, who was the number one overall pick with Minnesota uh, for a long time. And then a young tackle who was only in his second year when I was there, but has turned into a Pro Bowl, multiple Pro Bowl tackle, Deion Dawkins um, from Buffalo. You know, so, and then Ryan Khalil for a short time there in Carolina. So I got to play with some future Hall of Famers, some guys that have made Pro Bowls, some All-Pro guys that I always got to pick and learn from. That was just always great to be around those guys because you always try and watch what they do and try and understand what makes them so great, not just on the field, but off the field, um, which I picked a lot of stuff up from those guys. Toughest defensive lineman or linebacker that you faced? Um, in college, it was absolutely Vaughn Miller. Um, when I was a redshirt freshman and he was a senior and second overall pick that year, he beat the living tar out of me. Um, <laughs> Sue obviously was an easy one when I was a freshman. Um, but in the NFL, um, Fletcher Cox was a guy that was extremely tough to try and get stopped. You, again, we talk about technique. I had to change my whole way that I set uh, when I played Fletcher Cox because he was so big and strong and powerful that if I set off the ball at all and let him get three steps in the ground, it was almost virtually impossible to stop him. Um, you know, he was a guy, and then Brandon Graham, also from the Eagles, um, he was a shorter guy. He was like six foot, but he had like the arms of like a six five player. And, you know, he was able to get under me and gave me a lot of problems um, in that respect. And then the last guy would be Akeem Hicks from Chicago. He was like trying to wrestle a grizzly bear. Um, I mean, just an enormous human that was very unorthodox on how he did things um, and how he was able to 
to you know create disruption and he all of a sudden he tee off on you one play and the next play he's swimming you as you're falling on your face you know so he was uh, another one of those really hard guys and then a guy that I just reveled a chance to go against is I played against uh um oh my gosh I'm blanking on his name Julius Peppers I got to play against Julius Peppers against the entire game when he was in Carolina and that for me was kind of a surreal one because I grew up watching that guy and was like man this guy's a stallion and then you're out there putting your hands on him like holy crap I'm really doing it um you know so those were those were some of the names that just come off the top of my list favorite running back you block for not best there's a difference between best and favorite for an offensive lineman because I feel like you hear that a lot from from offensive linemen who who help on the blocks, who are a great teammate, all of that. So I feel like that's it's different, not best, but favorite. Yeah, and my favorite was Jarek McKinnon. Jarek McKinnon in Minnesota in 2016, 2017. Um, you know, he was a guy that was supposed to be kind of a third down scat back that turned himself into a super hard runner in between the whistles, or in between the, the lines. And, you know, he was just a guy that you loved blocking for. He was a smaller guy, but could just take it the distance anytime and also just a great teammate. And the other thing I respected about him a ton, and it's honestly something that's helped him win a Super Bowl Kansas City, was his pass blocking ability. He was a guy that, as you're up there in the protection meetings, he's sitting in the back of the room listening, understanding, because running backs are so pivotal in the protection schemes of, hey, us, us five and the running back are picking up all these blitzes. And so I loved the ability to, to have him and how he just put himself in our O-line room and kind of took care of us and loved up on us and was never that like come down on us, but also commanded a lot out of us. Best offensive line coach. And, you know, again, I think you could probably go on a tangent on this one, but the you, yeah. we just went into a, a big explanation of all the technique and everything. So who was the best offensive line coach you played for? Yeah, I mean, uh, Coach Cotton comes to mind, you know, because he developed me into the player that I was, him and John Garrison, uh, in college. You know, I wouldn't be able to go to the NFL without them. Um, in the NFL, uh, you know, jo Joe DeLisandris, who was with the Chargers, but then now has moved on. He's with Baltimore now. He was the one that taught me how to cross train. He was the one that said, hey, you know, you play tackle, but you're going to play guard and you're going to play center. And that helped me have a long career in the NFL. And then John Matsko with Carolina, I had a very short time with him, but he was such a technician and such a, hey, here's different tools. You can use different ways to set and just drilled the heck. I mean, we worked. He worked us to the bone. But, you know, I appreciate it because it made me better. You know, there's some guys that I had that would just work us to work. You know, it's like, hey, more work equals more success versus Matsko was like, no, we're working specific things with specific targets and we're going to work really hard at it. But you're going to become a better offensive line uh, coach for it, um, offensive line player for it. You know, so those guys really, I feel like, helped me take big jumps throughout my career from rookie year to that was in my fifth year um, and, you know, and everything in between. Well, fascinating conversation, my friend. I know you got to run. We might, well, we're going to have to do a part two in oh. the summer because two, I mean, I have three, like four, several five. questions that I didn't get to. Um, but this is our, our last episode of this season. We mm -hmm. are going to absolutely keep this going, but did want to give a, a shout out to Anthony and Valentino's Pizza for sponsoring us all season long. And we'll get another one going, but uh, this is the last one for this season, which is crazy to think about. It is wild, you know, and if you do and love uh, part of this, you know, the O-line play, what we do, I've launched another podcast, the O-line committee. Um, it's on uh, YouTube right now. You know, we break down NFL offensive line with another guy, Alex Boone, who's a 10-year NFL vet, who's my partner in the uh, uh, the training aspect. You know, so we go down and we break down the intricacies of we've done San Francisco, we've done Philly, uh, Vikings, we're going to do the Giants coming up. You know, just looking at what make these teams so different, but also what make them so great from an offensive line's perspective. I think people love to hear offensive line talk. People just don't take the time to do it, right? Exactly. So. Awesome. Well, appreciate it. We'll uh, circle back and hopefully we'll chat with you again coming up here in uh, the next month or so and uh, get a summer pod going. Absolutely. Yeah. Football season's almost here, man. Woo! Go Big Red. <laughs> that is Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cooney. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers.